We all know the Earth's surface acceleration, little g, is approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. However, because of the finer details of the Earth, including variations in altitude, its non-uniform mass distribution, its slight elliptical shape, and its spin, the apparent surface gravity actually changes slightly depending on location. In this video, we're going to focus on the fourth effect, the spin. We'll determine our effective gravity, g effective, as a function of latitude angle by including a centrifugal force correction. This is going to give us a vectorial answer for g effective, and in calculating its magnitude, we'll use a highly accurate binomial approximation to give us a clean result. Let's get started. All right, so here we have our Earth. We're going to treat it as a perfect sphere of some radius r sub e here, and it has some mass capital M sub e. Our Earth is spinning about its axis with some constant angular velocity, capital omega. Notice how I've defined this angular velocity here as a vector. You use the right hand rule, curl the fingers of your right hand, in the direction of this angular velocity here, and your thumb is going to point upwards, which is the direction of this angular velocity vector. And so what we want to do is we want to find the effective gravitational acceleration on a point at some latitude angle theta. All right, and we can tackle this problem fairly easily using a non-inertial frame of reference. So what I personally like to do with problems like this is I like to be very clear about distinguishing my inertial and non-inertial frames. So first I go through and I define my inertial frame. I'll call that I here. So what would that look like? That would look like this kind of God's eye view, which is watching the Earth as it spins. Right, it's kind of fixed in space here, and it's truly able to capture the Earth's rotation. But, and this is kind of the key point here, are we as people actually analyzing the physics at play in our inertial frame? No, right? We are on the surface of the Earth. What's happening for us is we are spinning with the Earth. So we're looking at the physics from this non-inertial frame N here. So we're going to analyze the physics in this non-inertial frame N, which is spinning with the Earth, because that's where we're doing the observations from. Is that 100% clear? Frames of reference are ultimately a choice, so we want to choose the frame of reference from which we're making the observations from. Okay, so great. So both I and N agree that if I were dropping a ball, the ball is just free falling. It's getting pulled towards the center of the Earth by the force of gravity, mg, right? Okay, but if we're going to work in this non-inertial frame N here, we also have to include a fictitious force, a centrifugal force, F centrifugal. Okay, and so if we're tracking the position of our ball with some position vector that I'm going to call R, then Newton's second law is going to look like as follows. Sigma F in the N frame is going to be equal to our force of gravity plus this introduced fictitious force F centrifugal. And of course, this all equals MA or MR double dot. Acceleration is the second time derivative of our position. Okay, so let me go ahead and pause here for a second and make sure that we're totally on the same page. So this r double dot, this acceleration in the end frame, that's ultimately what we're after, right? This is the effective gravitational acceleration that we want to solve for. It's the acceleration that we on Earth in this end frame are actually measuring. Whereas this g here, this is purely due to the pull of the Earth, right? So in other words, magnitude of g would look like gme over re squared, right? This theoretical value predicted purely by Newton's law of gravitation. All right, now to proceed from here, what do we need? We need to figure out what our centrifugal force actually is. All right, now very generally, the centrifugal force, F centrifugal, is defined as minus m omega cross omega cross 
r. Now, there's always a couple different strategies for using these kind of vectorial cross product type formulas. Option one is to just use it directly and start taking our cross products. That's kind of the most direct, but also the longest and most inefficient way. The much smarter thing to do is to first intuit the direction of the centrifugal force, which I've already drawn here, and then focus on getting out the magnitude of the centrifugal force. So first off, how exactly did I intuit this direction here? Well, if we're on this spinning earth here, then really we're just traversing out a circle, right? So really what we have here is we're on a merry-go-round, right? We're circling on this merry-go-round here, and intuitively we know that if you're standing on the edge of a merry-go-round, there's going to be this tendency from the centrifugal force to push you out, right? And so we were able to intuit that direction. That being said, you know, if you're against intuition and you want to verify this fact, then use the right hand rule for cross products. Get that practice in and verify that the output vector is going to point in this direction I have here. And so getting out just the magnitude, that's what I'm gonna focus on next. Let's focus on getting out the magnitude of our centrifugal force. And that's gonna be really easy because if we just imagine that we're spinning on this circle here, this pink circle, right? So I am on the edge of this pink circle getting pushed out by the centrifugal force, right? And from the center, this is going to have some radius capital R and it is spinning right with this angular velocity here capital omega this is a very simple formula right the magnitude of our centrifugal force here is just going to be m omega squared times r all right but what is this actual length capital r here right that's going to be the length of this radius of this circle there and i think we're starting to see a triangle forming all right, so let me go ahead and draw our right triangle out here, right? The length that we're interested in, we want R. What is this hypotenuse here? Oh, that hypotenuse is clearly this R sub E here, just the radius of our Earth. What is this angle here? Oh, well, if this angle here is theta, then this angle here is 90 minus theta right you see that clearly we have 90 minus theta there and so this r here is going to be equal to r e sine 90 minus theta but you know trig identities sine of 90 minus theta this is just going to be cos theta all right so let's update our picture here r here is going to be equal to r sub e cos theta okay and i updated our formula accordingly Nice, so now we've got the magnitude of our centrifugal force here. So let's go ahead and wrap this up by putting together what this looks like as a vector, right? So we're interested in how this centrifugal force is modifying our gravitation, right? And so we can actually break this into two components, right? We can break our vector like this into one component that is acting in line with gravity and one component that is acting perpendicular to gravity. So let me go in and very quickly define some unit vectors. I'm gonna call the unit vector that goes in line with gravity, we're gonna call this x hat, and I'm going to call the unit vector orthogonal to that y hat. All right, and I've blown up this blue triangle, right? I blew it up right over here, okay? And can you very clearly see that this angle here, this angle, this is theta, right? So here is theta, okay? And so can you very clearly see with this triangle that our centrifugal force in the x hat direction, that's going to be F centrifugal cos theta, and in the y hat direction, that's going to be F centrifugal sine theta. All right, so now it's super duper clear that, so our F centrifugal is going to be, right, this magnitude F centrifugal times cos theta in the x hat direction plus sine theta in the y hat direction. So let's plug our magnitude right in there. Very good, let's box up this result. All right, excellent. 
So next we're just gonna plug this straight in for F centrifugal. And then of course for our gravity here, we can see that Mg is going to be acting in the minus X hat direction. Okay, so we're just going to plug minus Mg X hat straight in there. Okay, and before I even actually plug these in, I think we can all see that our masses are going to cancel out here, you know, leaving us with just our G effective. And so we're going to have that G effective is going to be equal to omega squared RE cos squared theta minus G in the X hat direction plus omega squared RE cos theta sine theta in the y hat direction. Let's go ahead and box this result. All right, super interesting. So we can see in this result that not only my apparent gravity, you know, in line with my gravitation is changing, but I'm also now having this additional second component here in this perpendicular y hat direction. All right, wonderful. So next let's go ahead and go through and calculate the magnitude of our effective gravity here. And of course we know that's just gonna be equal to the square root of, you know, take your vector, dot it with itself, just like this, that's going to give you the magnitude. You know, and as you might expect, as we go in here and actually plug into this formula, we're going to have these squares that we need to distribute and so, you know, we're probably going to get a couple of terms, you know, and so after we expand those terms out, we might be looking at our answer here and going, oh, well, this is kind of ugly, actually, you know, this isn't quite the nice, elegant answer we were hoping to get. But, you know, we can think about this a little bit deeper and go, well, our angular velocity of our Earth you know, which is going to be one over the period, you know, one day is going to be 24 hours. And so this angular velocity is really going to be something like the order of 10 to the minus fifth radians per second when you do that conversion. And so this is a pretty small number, right? And so, you know, if you're raising that in these omega to the fourth terms, we're talking something of 10 to the minus 20th. That is just so, so much smaller than this term with the omega squared, and th especially this term with no omegas on it at all. Okay, and so we can safely approximate these terms here and say, you know what, these are so trivially small, I'm going to say they go to zero. All right, so now our radical looks a lot simpler, but we can actually go one step further by using a binomial approximation. So I've given us, you know, in the top right here, this Taylor expansion of one plus X raised to the one half. Okay, and so we can apply that to this square root here, but first we have to massage it a little bit. First we have to go ahead and rewrite this, you know, such that on the inside of this radical it looks like we have a 1 plus x in there. This is really, really important. So what we need to do is first, and I'm actually going to write this out in two steps so that this is super clear. First, I'm going to pull the g squareds out within the radical, so I can pull a g squared out and I'll have 1 minus 2 omega squared r sub e cos squared theta over g, right? And then I'll apply this radical to this g squared here, you know, and then I'll have g square root 1 minus 2 omega squared r sub e cos squared theta over g. And now this radical here looks exactly like the form of this radical here. And so we can plug straight into our binomial expansion. We're going to have this is equal to g times 1 minus omega squared r sub e cos squared theta over g plus our higher order terms, which are going to look like omega to the fourth, right? I got this just by plugging this guy right here straight in for x. Okay, and so far I haven't done any approximating because if we had all of these higher order terms written out here, you know, this radical will be equal to its Taylor expansion when you write all of those terms out. Now, the approximation comes in because we're going to say, you know, just like before, oh, but you know, these terms with these omega to the fourth and beyond, they're so, so small, let's just call those effectively zero. 
And so we just applied that approximation. And so we're going to be left with G effective is going to be approximately G minus omega squared R sub E cos squared theta. All right, so awesome. We have our final expression here for G effective as a function of our latitude angle theta. And so let's go ahead and wrap this up by thinking about some extreme cases, right? We should have a good understanding of what this equation is telling us. What would happen if we were at the equator? Okay, then theta, theta at the equator would just be zero. And so, you know, cos squared zero, just that's gonna turn into one. And so we're going to have G effective here is equal to G minus omega squared times R sub E. You know, that's where our effective gravity is going to be the smallest. That's where our centrifugal force is most dominant. But in contrast, if we go to, you know, the North Pole, now theta is gonna be equal to 90, you know, cos squared 90, that's gonna give us zero. And so we have G effective equals G. That's where our effective gravity is going to be the largest because we don't have any of that centrifugal force because, you know, our effective radius of this circling at the poles is going to zero. So we have none of that centrifugal force. All right, so I'm talking about these extremes because I wanna wrap this up with one final point, which is where does it actually make sense to go through and define our quote unquote uniform gravitational acceleration constant, which I'm calling G naught here, right? We would want this value to apply as best as possible to, you know, everywhere around the earth. And so we wouldn't want to measure the gravitational acceleration at the extremes at the polar or the equator. We would want to go right in the middle. We would want to measure our gravitational acceleration at theta equal to 45 degrees. That's going to give us the best approximated value for G naught, which is going to apply everywhere on the earth. And indeed, that little G value that we love so, so much is defined at theta equal to 45 degrees measured at sea level. If you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, be sure to like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.